Greetings, my wonderful Facebook family. This is your main man and your best friend, Johnny Cash, and we are All right. How to acquire a new home for under 2,000 That's what we're talking about this evening. Now, there is a serious problem in the housing situation for a lot of people. And uh, we're going to talk about that tonight. And we're going to deal with that situation and come to grips with some means by which we can make an adjustment in, uh, in that particular state of affairs. Paula, thanks for chiming in. Great to see you. Alyssa, thanks for chiming in. So good. We're gonna get started in just a minute. Want to take a couple of seconds to uh, allow my peeps to chime in with us, and they're chiming in with us. Sabrine, thanks for chiming in. Great to see you. Yeah. So, so let's talk about this. Let's 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 talk about. You know, what we're going to get into is an area that every attorney is familiar with. Every attorney is, is familiar with this. And uh, they, they learn about it in law school in their first year. When a law student takes their first semester of courses, one of the courses that they take is called real property. And actually, the first week of real property, they learn about what I'm going to get into this evening. Now, it's interesting because I knew some attorney back in the day who had lost their homes and for all practical purposes had been rendered homeless. And I'm thinking what gives here because I know that they know better than to be out in the streets with uh, a cup in their hand, uh, nowhere to go, and all that good stuff. You know, because I'm knowing what they know. I'm knowing what they learned the first week, not the first year, how about the first week? of law school, right? Okay. And what they learned in a nutshell is how to acquire a property for virtually no cash at all. We say virtually because there will be some cash required because of certain expenses that would have to be covered in the process, right? Terry, thanks for chiming in. Hey, my man, Terry. Yes, sir. Uh, so this particular process naturally would require some financial um, um, circulation in order to pay the expenses for various things that would have to take place in the process, okay? All right then, so what is this process called? What is this process called? And, and before I tell you the name of, 
of the process. Let me tell you this. It's a damn shame. And you can do the research and pull up the stats if you want to. Somebody might want to do it while we're live and, and, and drop something, you know, in the comment section. Uh, but I'm talking about the, the stats of homelessness. How many homeless people are currently in America? Now, I did a post a couple of years ago where I broke it down to where, and it, it hasn't changed. It has not changed. There are more vacant houses in America than there are homeless. What does that mean? It means that we should not have any homeless people in America. All right? So however many millions of homeless people that we have in America, Double that, and you'll be in a safe ballpark as to how much housing is available vis-a-vis -vis the number of homeless in America. Now, that's a, literally a crime against humanity. And your politicians are responsible for that state of affairs. Well, I'm not a politician. I'm just your main man and your best friend, Johnny Cash. And I know from my years of research and from my years of being a real estate investor, how easy it is to make housing available for people, homeless or not. Housing is plentiful, you see. All right, now, having said that, let's go to the next level with this. The process that lawyers learn about, or law students learn about in their first week of law school is a process called adverse possession. Yes, adverse possession. Okay. So Johnny Cash, are you saying that adverse possession is the remedy for homelessness? What I'm saying is that adverse possession is a remedy that law students learn in the first week of law school. So I'll let you connect the dots and make a determination as to where it fits within the great scheme of things. All right, now, let's move forward. Adverse possession is a law that is on the books in all 50 states, all 50 states. Now, what's interesting about tonight's presentation is that I'm going to put, we got any pool sharks, <laughs> right? I'm gonna put some English on, right? I'm gonna put some English on adverse possession or I'm going to put, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to give you um, an introduction to the subject matter of adverse possession but I'm going to put a spin on this piece right I'm going to put a spin on it or if we were shooting pool put some english on it. all right okay now let's do this let's read and 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 I'm not going to be before you long, but I am going to be before you strong. So I'm just going to hit it and quit it as we go through some of the aspects under what is known in law as 
the legal theory of adverse possession. Okay, now. So, let's give a general breakdown of adverse possession. We're going to define it. Okay. Now, what I'm what I'm using for purposes of tonight's broadcast, because it was the file that I was able to get my hands on quick because I was already late uh, bringing this information tonight. So I said, where's that damn file? So, so the state of California came up first, so that's what we're going to deal with. Okay. The legal doctrine that allows trespasses to become owners is called adverse possession. Although the name sounds nasty, the trespasser is not necessarily an intentional evil doer. Far from it. The trespasser may simply have made a mistake, relying on a faulty property description in a deed, for example. In rural areas, the person who moves in and occupies several acres may believe he owned it, having purchased it from a scoundrel who sold someone else part of the Brooklyn Bridge. Questions about ownership often wind up in court after an absent owner of rural property discovers that someone is living on his land or when a piece of urban property is sold, a title insurance company refuses to issue insurance because the neighbor's garage is found to be standing squarely on the property. If the people involved can't work something out, the property owner may sue the trespasser, or the trespasser may bring a lawsuit to quiet title, a request for the court to settle who owns what. All right, now. Let's take it another further. Now, I'm gonna read the section that deals with requirements for obtaining land by adverse possession. A trespasser is entitled to legal ownership of property if his occupation of the property is hostile, actual, open and notorious, exclusive and continuous for a period of years set by state statute. Some states, such as California, also require the trespasser to have paid the local property taxes on the land. The time required, which varies from state to state, is usually 20 years. It can be as short as five years when the trespasser pays the property taxes. If my memory serves me correctly, I think that is the state of Texas that allows for that five year time frame. If you're from Texas, let me know. All right, so now remember the requirements. There were four. The trespass is entitled to legal ownership of the property if his occupation of the property is number one, hostile, number two, actual, number three, open, number four, notorious, right? Okay, hostile. Hostile doesn't mean that you roll up on the house with a shotgun. That, that's not what hostile means under the theory of adverse possession, right? 
Pastel simply means that you know that that's not your house. That's that's all hostel means within the contemplation of the law. It means that you know that's not your house. Period. Right? Okay. All right. Now, we also said actual was another one of the requirements under the theory of adverse possession. Okay. And uh, actual means that if you want the house, you have to be the one to take possession of the house. That's what actual means. Actual means that you can't have your homie go and take possession of the house so that you can get it. That's not actual. So you have failed to meet the criteria under the theory of adverse possession. Got me? Okay. So if you bad, you want it, you have to go and get it. So when we talk about adverse possession, <laughs> all practical purposes, this is a process for gangsters only. In a nutshell, you have to be gangster with your process. <clears throat> Again, not criminal because this is a legal, lawful process under the civil statutes of all 50 states, right? So actual simply means you have to take charge of the process. You can't delegate to somebody, all right? Open means you can't hide the fact that you take an open. What did Michael Jackson say? We're taking over. We have to. Okay. This is your mission to see it through. That's what open means. I'm taking this and I'm taking it in your face. Yo means any bystanders, any neighbors. Because under the theory of adverse possession, the presumption is that the owner is absentee, number one, and has abandoned the property, number two. All right? Okay, then. So an empty house can become a problem for the community at some point. A woman can get raped in the house. Someone can get killed in the house. It can turn into a dope house. Anything can happen on abandoned property. So abandoned properties are not good for the community. And it is for that reason that we have on the books laws pertaining to adverse possession. So don't feel that you're doing something wrong when you're able to, through your research, find a candidate for adverse possession or a number of candidates for adverse possession. You're doing something good for the community. Now, now don't get it twisted, people. Don't get it twisted. If a house has a sign for sale, that's not a candidate for adverse possession. That's not an abandoned property. That property is clearly on the market for sale. You can't take that property. Oh, well, you can, but uh, you can't tell them that your main man and your best friend Johnny Cash told you because guess what? I don't know you. <laughs> Holler if you hear. Yeah. Now, I know guys 
who've gone to jail, not jail, prison. Jail is where you go before your sentence. Prison is where you go after the fact. I know guys who are doing prison time. For do yeah, that shit is funny. Not funny to the guys who's in the prison, though. But, you know, and and <laughs> when I met the guy, I said, so what 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 made you take the house, man? What why did you, you know, what was it that made you decide that you wanted to take that house? You know, he said, uh, he said, man, they wrong, man. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna sue these people, man, for for unlawful imprisonment. I said, okay, so explain this to me like I'm a sit like I'm a sit here. How did you learn about the property initially? He said, I was, you know, driving through the neighborhood and I saw a nice property that I liked that was for sale. I said, pump the brakes right there. For sale? He said, yeah. I said, how in the hell did you allow yourself to get possessed into the thought that you could, under the theory of adverse possession, acquire a property that was listed for sale. Well, I can do it, man. I know the process. Apparently, you didn't know the process because your ass got handed to you <laughs> on a silver platter, and you did prison time for that shit, man. You know? And uh, no, you don't, you don't do that. It's not like that. It doesn't go like that. It does not go like that. OK? OK. So if a property has a sign where it is for sale, clearly the owner is not absentee. The owner is present. Worst case scenario, the owner is present through the agent, right? OK, then. So. There is no absentee owner. There is no abandoned property because the property is listed for sale, right? Okay, then. So that is not a candidate for adverse possession. Any property that you see for sale is not a candidate for adverse possession. That's what you call laziness. And they got a place for lazy people. It's called prison, right? Okay, fine. Okay then, so we talked about hostile, we talked about actual, we talked about open, and notorious goes hand in hand with open, and again, it simply means that it must be obvious to anyone, including an owner who investigates, that a trespasser is on the premises. Actual physical possession is usually open and notorious. Someone out in the field investigating crops is obvious, as is a person pruning the rose garden that she planted on a strip of the neighbor's backyard. Similarly, a neighbor who just put a fence up slightly on the next door property is obvious. So is the one who just poured a concrete driveway two feet over the boundary line, right? Okay. So, so you've learned the four requirements for adverse possession. There's some elements that are called exclusive and continuous possession that I'm not going to get into at this particular time because like i said i'm not going to be before you long but i am going to be before you strong i want to give you enough reality about this subject so that you will understand the viability of us ending homelessness homelessness can be resolved. Okay, now, let's talk about payment of property taxes. 
under the theory of adverse possession. Okay? Some states require the trespasser to have paid the property taxes for the statutory time under the tax code, under the uh, real estate uh, property tax. If all the other requirements are met except the tax payment, a court will usually grant a prescriptive easement to use the property to the trespasser instead of ownership through adverse possession, right? Okay, now, I'm about to wrap this thing up. I'm about to wrap this thing up because we can study this thing like we in law school, but I ain't got time to take you to law school. <laughs> But the time I do have, I'm gonna give it to you. All right, now here we go. Now here comes the English piece. I told you I was gonna put some English on this. All right, here we go. Here we go. All right. Let's give it one second. Bada bing, bada boom. Okay. Here we go. All right, now watch this. Now what I'm about to read to you is on the books in every state. All right? Now, remember that we said that under the theory of adverse possession, there's a statutory time frame that differs in every state as to how long one must play the game before they can receive a judicial deed to the property, right? I'm now about to give you a section in the California statute that supersedes the ordinary time frame. Here we go. <clears throat> and this is how I acquire. Let me let me let me put some English on that English. <laughs> this is how. I teach with respect to the expeditious acquisition of abandoned properties under the theory of adverse possession. Is adverse possession with a spin? Now here comes the spin. All right. Now. The time within which an action for the foreclosure of a lien, securing an assessment against real property for street improvements, the proceedings for which are prescribed by legislation of any political unit other than the state may be commenced, shall be two years from and after the date on which the assessment or any bond secured thereby or the last installment of the assessment or bond shall be due or as to existing rights of action not heretofore barred one year after the effective date hereof whichever time is late after that time, if the lien has not been otherwise removed, the lien ceases to exist and the assessment is conclusively presumed to be paid. The official having charge of the records of the assessment shall mark it, quote, conclusively presumed 
paid, unquote. If at the expiration of the time within which such action might be brought, he has received no written notice of the pendency of the action. Okay, so now let me translate. That means that if in your state you have to play the adverse possession game for 25 years before you get a deed, you can supersede that requirement by foreclosing on a mechanics lien filed against the property and acquiring a judicial deed in the process. Let me say that again. 99 people out of 100 people who have studied adverse possession do not know that they can accelerate the time frame of ownership by filing a mechanics lien on the property and foreclosing on that lien, thereby receiving a judicial deed before the statutory time frame under the theory of adverse possession has expired. How do you like me now? You say, well, how do you do that? No charge for this. I'm going to drop this on you and no additional charge. We use the people's court. What do you mean the people's court? You've seen Judge Mathis, Judge Judy, small claims court. You never see attorneys in there, do you? Okay, then. That's a small claim court. File a mechanics lien on the property. And you receive a judicial deed via fulfilling the necessary administrative requirements, right? And you take your evidence and you file your petition in the small claims court and you are awarded a judicial deed for the property. That's how the process is accelerated. And of course, there's <clears throat> certain technical things that have to be factored into the equation and what have you. One of the things you never want to do is do a process of this nature in your name. You want to always use a private trust and you are simply operating on behalf of the trust to distance you from the transaction. Okay, beauty. Now I wanna share a story with you. A number of years ago, I had a friend who was a broker and as an investor, you know, we had a investment, we had a uh, 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 investors um, broker relationship. Right. So we were having lunch at her home and uh, she she uh, introduced me to her family and stuff, you know. She was a single mom, so introduced me to her sons and daughters and whatnot. And uh, one of her daughters <clears throat> had just lost her home. And uh, so it was interesting because she she said, Johnny, they driving me crazy. She said, I love my I love my baby, I love my grandbabies, but but they driving me crazy, man. I said, you know what? If you crazy, I'm crazy. I, we we can't we can't both be crazy up in here now. So we're gonna have to cure crazy. I told her, I said, Don't worry. I got 
I have to kill for praise. She said, what, what you got? I said, uh, go look in your database and, and, and find me something abandoned. I need an abandoned property. I need an abandoned property. Come on. We're going to work some magic. We're going to work some magic. All right? So she found something. She found something. And I went through the necessary, we went through the necessary process. And uh, put everything together, and uh, within three months, we were able to move her daughter and grandchildren out of her house into their own home. And uh, the magnitude—I knew that I had lifted a major burden off of my friend's shoulders, but the magnitude of the lift did not reveal itself to me until one evening. Her daughter had brought, had come by and had brought the children and uh, her 10 year old daughter ran in the house and saw me and grabbed me around my waist and said, thank you so much, Mr. Cash, for helping my mom. No, thank you so much, Mr. Cash, for getting me, for getting us a new home. And it messed me up. It, it, it hit me hard. It hit me hard. You know what I'm saying? You know, um, th there's a, there's a human, there's a human side to this. <clears throat> There's a business side, but there's a human side. When you actually meet the needs of somebody, it makes everything worth while, right? And so we have the solution. We have the solution. The person who does this process out of pocket, what? In 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 most state, no, in every state, in every state, to file the action in the uh, small claims court is not going to exceed $250. Right. Uh, we're going to do, we're going to do some basic repairs on the abandoned property outside, outside, to increase curb appeal. And the cost there shouldn't be more than two hundred, two hundred fifty dollars. Right? And so that's going to be the lien. That's going to be the mechanics lien that we put on the property. Right? And uh, that's how we do that. That's how we do that. Now, I am available, <clears throat> but not for long, to help a few men and women, a few brothers and sisters, a few ladies and gentlemen, a few of my beautiful Facebook friends and family in this process to acquire a home. It may be for you. It may be for a loved one. It, you may have children worrying the hell out of you with your grandchildren <laughs> like my friend did, right? Right? So talk to me. If this is something that can benefit you or a loved one. Talk to me, leave a comment, or hit me in my uh, messenger. Say, Johnny Cash, I want to talk to you about that, uh, about that acquisition program. And we'll talk about it, and I'll let you know what is required uh, financially. 
but I'll tell you this right now. I have done this for a number of years. I'm a professional at this. I've taught it for a number of years. Uh, by the end of spring, I won't be doing any of this anymore. I'll be retiring as a business consultant. I'll be moving fast forward into the record industry and entertainment. I'm launching a record label uh, in the spring and uh, um, a film production company as well. So that is going to be where all of my focus goes. So you better get me while you can because by the end of spring, that will mark the end of my career as a business consultant. I won't be doing this anymore. So hit me up while you have the opportunity and let's talk and I will um, let you know how we can work together to move your life forward or a family member, loved one, all right? Okay, listen, it's been a ball, y'all. And because this is a recorded broadcast, I want you to review it, listen to it again, and reach out to me and let me take care of you. You do that and I will absolutely see you and yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, I really do mean you at the top. Good night.